introduce uh, our speaker for today. We can get started. Um, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lauren Crawford, a senior researcher at Microsoft Research New England and RGSS assistant professor of biostatistics at Brown University. I've seen that so many times now, I still have no idea what RGSS stands for, but maybe, maybe Lauren doesn't either. Um, uh, Dr. Crawford is unique. He's made important contributions to, to genetics um, while also using methodology that is sort of broadly interesting to people in um, the statistics and machine learning communities. Uh, he has a very broad uh, interests in computational biology, um, but the center point is, seems to always be the development of novel methods uh, to garner insights from complex and emerging data, site, data types, particularly like nonlinear models and, and non-tabular data. And I believe we're going to hear um, some more about that work today. Um, I look forward to hearing about it and uh, I'll be monitoring the chat um, throughout. So uh, feel free if you have questions um, to put them in the Q&A um, and then I will um, uh, I will moderate that towards the end. Um, and so without any further ado, um, uh, hand it over to you, Lauren. Awesome, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, this is gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, so this is the, the talk today is gonna be on this idea of using statistical frameworks for mapping 3D shape variation onto gene type of phenotype variation. I'll kind of walk everyone through like what I mean by this. Um, and so, uh, like Brinlin mentioned, I'm a computational biologist, I guess, is how I might describe myself. I'm a statistician by training. Um, and so I, I, a re current research theme in my group um, is to take modern computational approaches and develop theory that enable their interpretations to be related back to actual uh, classic genomic principles. So I think of myself as not someone that builds uh, really fancy hammers and looks for uh, specific nails or the nails to just hit. I think about this actual biological question as a nail and I build a specific hammer for that particular question. Um, and so a, a recurring theme underlying a lot of my work is this idea of dissecting phenotypic variation. So you could think about the, our traits as, as, as humans or model organisms as an entire pie. You can break that pie up into different types of components. Um, there's an additive component uh, from, a, from a genetic perspective, which are like gene A's effect plus gene B's effect onto a phenotype. Uh, there are pairwise interactions, so gene A times gene B's effect. There are third order interactions, and you can also think about our, our ways that our environment play a role and how they interact with our genetics to give rise to complex traits as well. And so here I like to show this uh, picture on the left-hand side where these are uh, 131 different phenotypes from mice. And what we did is we kind of broke down this genetic architecture to try to estimate what proportion of these, uh, of heritability from these traits are coming from additive nonlinear effects or maybe from the environment that these mice were crossed in. Um, and what you can see is that very rarely sometimes this additivity actually play a, a substantial role. You kind of have this mixture of nonlinear structure kind of going on in this data. And that really motivates us uh, as a group when we use like machine learning methods uh, and understanding how to do association mapping quite well. Well, today we're not going to focus on like quantitative traits in this aspect. We're going to think about modeling variation across shapes. So here our traits are going to be this idea of, uh, you know, on the left, you can have different uh, uh, images of, of bird beaks from, from finches, or you can have different uh, heel bones from primates. That's what you see on the right-hand side. We're going to spend a lot of time with primates data on the, on the right. And so my presentation now is going to be uh, this idea of um, doing association mapping with shapes. Okay, so variable selection on, on shape, with shape data. And so I'm gonna start with this idea of working through the history of comparing shapes and statistics. We're gonna settle on this idea of using topological summary statistics, the topology, topological data analysis as a way to quantify variation in shapes. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, how to use these topological summary statistics for prediction-based tasks in radiomics, so clinical imaging. Um, and then we're gonna talk about uh, this, this method, this pipeline that my group has been developing this uh, called Sinatra. And Sinatra is this pipeline uh, on, for variable selection on 3D surfaces and, and objects. And so I'll go over an I'll go overview of, of the different components of Sinatra in this pipeline, and I'll show you how it's used both via simulations and also in real data. Okay, and then I'll also talk a little bit about the, my motivation for choosing this acronym Sinatra. Um, so the, the, the history of, of shapes within statistics is actually really quite interesting. And so classic shape stats used to take uh, really complex structures and represent them via what we call landmarks. So these kind of uh, lower dimensional signatures for how to describe variability on 3D surfaces. Okay, so what you see here is this skull. 
Um, and what someone has done as an as a expert has gone in and said that these particular regions of the skull are what we can use to define, uh, define the variation of this, of this object. And then we can just look at the landmarks as a way to compare across different shapes. Okay. Now, as you can imagine, if I take this, this is, this is a, a quite variable, right? Because if I take a, the same uh, expert and I give him two different skulls, he might have some error in whether you're placing these landmarks. And obviously, <laughs> even funnier, if I, if I take the same expert, give the individual a skull, they place landmarks, take the skull away, give them back the same skull, you might place two different sets of landmark positions. So not the best method, but this idea of landmarks is actually quite well used and founded uh, in terms of future stuff that we do now, right? So currently what we do now is based, uh, still like this idea of in biological metrics, we use these landmark-based approaches to define shapes, um, but we do it in a more semi-automatically defined way, right? And so you can see these kind of nice diffeomorphism of correspondences between two these are teeth from primates. So here you have a, a carnivore on the left and a herbivore on the right, and each dot corresponds to the other tooth from the other primate, right? And what you could do once you have these kind of correspondence maps or these landmarks between each shape, so then I can go in, I can define distance functions, right? I can take the vertices from each of these shapes and then I can define a distance function that says how similar according to these landmarks is this tooth versus this tooth, right? Um, now, the, the nice thing about landmarks is it gives us a really nice way to define um, similarities and do kind of really cool distance metrics here. The issue though is one, I have to have these nice correspondences between these two objects, right? If I don't have that, I can't just use this method. The other uh, tough thing here is if I want to describe um, the variation between these two objects, and let's say I have an output, so let's say I have these teeth for each primate, and I might have like a quantitative or, or a, a, a categorical response between them, right? I can't necessarily do this across many objects. It gets quite tough to think about how to do like a classification based thing where I have many observations of class one and class two, which is these um, landmark based features, right? But it's a great sound starting point of foundation from which we can work. Okay. So what my group takes advantage of actually now is, is the, uh, we take advantage of the improved imaging technology we have now, where we're, now we represent three dimensional objects as meshes. Okay, you can think about meshes, you're gonna hear me say this a lot, as a collections of vertices, edges, and faces. Okay, so here we have a brain tumor, uh, a brain and then a tumor. You can see how this tumor has been, or this brain has been triangulated. So we kind of created what we're gonna call, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit, a simplicial complex over this object, for which we're gonna to start to define topological summary stats. Okay, so my group works with this representation of data. Okay. Now going back to my main objectives for this, uh, for my group and what we like to think about when we're building methods in this space, is we want to have a shape enumeration or quantification method where the summary stats from this quantification can be used in a wide range of both regression and machine learning based techniques, right? So anything from generalized linear models to neural networks, right? Um, I want the desired properties from shape to summary stat to be a place where in my summary statistics space, I can build probability, I can define probabilities, compute distances, but also, really importantly, I want to be able to go from shape to summary statistic and the summary statistic back to shape. So I need that function that takes me to my summary statistic um, space to be invertible. Okay. And so what we're going to do to do this, and the reason why I want that is because I want to be able to do variable selection in summary statistic space and to be able to map that back onto my actual mesh. Okay. Um, so we're going to use what we're going to call topological summary stats to do this enumeration or quantification of, of uh, variation across objects. Okay? And we're going to use this, we're gonna, there are a lot of different topological invariants out there, but we're going to focus on two. One is the persistent homology transform, and in my group takes advantage of this oil characteristic transform. Okay? Um, I like to show this how this, this painting of Picasso, this is kind of what we think about when we use TDA. Right, you start with these really complicated or really complex structures on the left hand side. We're going to work in this topological space where we're going to uh, basically study holes uh, and, and uh, connected components of our objects. And then via do you able to do our classification in this lower dimensional space for what these high dimensional objects might be? Okay. So, what is persistent homology? Persistent homology takes advantage again of the quantification or the 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 uh, representation of shape data that we have today, right? Vertices, edges, and faces. Okay. What persistent homology does is it tracks these Betty numbers over what we call a simplicial complex. And so, a simplicial complex has uh, again zero complex is just a connected component uh, or a single uh, uh, component. 
uh, one simplex is an edge between these components, uh, two simplex, right? We have a triangle or a face, right? And then we can think about studying voids and tetrahedrons and things like that, okay? So prism homology really just tracks the evolution of these homology groups via some filtration operator, right? So I start with a point cloud. I grow these balls according to some filtration. I track how these homology groups, right, um, persist over that filtration. So there's a few ways to track this. The most common ways are these things called barcodes or persistence diagrams. So let's start with barcodes first, right? I start with these, my data cloud, my point cloud. I, I do is I take these, I, I grow these balls over some filtration. I track where um, these balls become connected to each other. So that's the H naught. So you can see it at the bottom, at the, the red uh, bars. I, I track when there are holes, right? Those are the green bars, how long circles or holes uh, persist. And I track when voids also persist over these filtrations until so I have just one huge large connected component, right? And that's that long H naught bar. Okay. There's another way to track this, which is the persistence diagram, which is what a lot of people actually use. Um, so same kind of idea. We're tracking, we're tracking the birth and death time of these features, but now we're going to do this in a, in a, a two-dimensional like XY uh, coordinate plane. Okay. So here I have a shape, two-dimensional object. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do these, I'm going to still have my filtrations, my filtration kind of idea, and I'm going to track when a certain feature is born and when a certain feature dies. And when I mean dies, I mean it becomes connected to another feature in the object, okay? So I'm going to filter upwards, okay? So we're going to start our filtration. I'm going to see my first component in my filtration. I'm going to track its birth time, okay? I'm going to go in, I'm going to see another feature, track its birth time. I see another feature, I track its birth time. Now notice, that feature is not going to last very long, right? As I keep filtering up, that feature is going to become connected to my very, very first feature, right? So that feature is going to die quite quickly, okay? So when I move up, that feature dies. I see another feature. I see another feature. Now, the feature we saw just one step before is going to die, right? Because it's going to be connected to that feature before it. So that dies. Another feature dies. And then we just have one large, huge connected component. Okay. This is the idea of, of a persistence diagram. So in convention, and there's been a lot of debate of this in the field, but conventionally speaking, people think about things along the diagonal, things that are features that are born and die quite quickly as being topological noise. And what you're really, really interested in are the things that are off diagonal, right? So how features off diagonal compare across different shapes, right? So let's take an example of this in, in real life. Um, these, these are maze roots, and it's actually a really cool study about maze roots. Um, you can actually study the topology of how maize roots grow, and it's actually a really nice predictor of like the amount of yield that that uh, corn, that cross will actually pr uh, produce. And so you can compare across crosses in their topological features to kind of see how much yield as a predictor this cross might be versus this cross, right? And so here we have these maize roots. What I can do is I can go in and I can say, okay, let's make these precise diagrams that I can do, again, create a distance function or some kind of function to compare these different uh, persistence diagrams to each other, how close or how similar they may not be, right? Now, the persistence homology transform is taking the same idea of the persistence diagram and persistence homology and moving it to 3D space, right? So we, we worked so far on 2D objects or 2D images, we could do the same kind of D in 3D, okay? So here we have a heel bone from a primate. And what we're gonna do in 3D space from the persistence homology transform perspective is I'm gonna have this shape I'm going to define a filtration. I'm going to filter across that object. I'm going to get a persistence diagram via that filtration, right? I'm going to take that diagram. I'm going to save it. Then I'm going to rotate the object and then do the sweep again, get that diagram and save it and do this over many directions along the unit sphere. Okay, so here's how this works. Visually, I have an object, a three-dimensional uh, uh, shape in some direction new. I'm going to define a height function. I'm going to filter over that height function, so you filter across. I get the diagram according to that filtration in that direction. I save it. I rotate the object, so I have a new direction, new to. I'm gonna have the same height function, sweep across, get that diagram, save it, and I do this over many directions over the unit sphere, right? So what we do in the persistence homology transform space for 3D is now we're not comparing just individual diagrams to each other, we're comparing collections of diagrams to each other, right? 
So now here's another data science example. Okay, so now we have heel bones from uh, 67 genre of, of primates. What we could do is we could take the collections of diagrams from each, uh, from each primate heel bone, do a distance function comparing across all of them, figure out how to plot these instances on a two-dimensional plane, see how similar they are to each other, and then we can overlay information of, okay, certain primates phylogenetically group together according to this heel bone structure. And that's what you're seeing on the right-hand side, okay? Now, the, the resistance homology transform is awesome, right? It allows us to now think about how to, in three dimensions, compare objects to each other. There's a, there's a key issue why the resistance homology transform is not great for my purposes, right? Uh, a birth and death time pair, which is basically what each feature is in a diagram, gives you this like, has a complicated geometry in terms of summary statistics space, right? So in most of our statistical regression models, what do we have? We have an effect side, right? And think about basically in your model. Most regression models produce some inner product structure that's defined in the Hilbert space, right? The PHT doesn't have a simple inner product structure that allows us to find like simple things that we do in regression. So the basic, most basic example is what's the interpretation of like an effect size or regression coefficient for birth and death time? Right, it's complicated to work with. So the PhD makes great advancements in this space, but it's not necessarily perfect for our particular use case. Okay, so what my group works with is what we call the Euler characteristic. Okay, and then the Euler characteristic again takes advantage of the same idea: vertices, edges, and faces. But now we get a single numerical number that represents this topological structure. Right, and it's a simple co computation: vertices minus edges plus faces. Okay, now. Same kind of idea in practice. Here's a basic 2D example. What we would do is we're going to now do sweeps over two dimensional objects, but now we're going to do things based on the Euler characteristic curve. And what we're going to do is we're going to, over this filtration, I'm going to uh, count the Euler characteristic over these different sub level sets or filtration steps. And then once I have that, I can rotate the object, do it again, and just concatenate curves that were produced over different directions along the unit sphere, okay? So here's how this works in practice. I have a filtration. I'm gonna create this curve here. We, we stop up across according to certain filtration of sublevel sets. I count the Euler characteristics across these sets. I'll have this, I'll rotate the object. I'll do it again. Now what I do is I take the first curve from the first direction, concatenate it with the second curve from the second direction. And what I'll have at the end of my different rotations is in like a basic design matrix of the form that we're all aware of, right? Where each row is an Euler characteristic curve that's been concatenated from different directions, right? It's a huge concatenated Euler characteristic curve, right? So I'll have an N by P matrix where P is a number of topological summary statistics or Euler characteristics I have in different directions and N will be the number of observations in my data set, okay? Now, what's nice about the Euler characteristic is that's a design matrix we all know how to work with, right? It's just like some uh, n by p matrix where each feature has some kind of definition and we have some rows, right? Um, and this now allows us to represent uh, our shapes in a data form that is now uh, fully minimal to all parametric and non-parametric methodologies, right? We also have invertibility here via bookkeeping, right? Every time I do a filtration step in my Euler characteristic, I know what direction that filtration was happening in, and I know what step of that filtration that that oil characteristic came from. So it's just me now reconstructing, going back to say I can now go from which point in my oil characteristic top off summary statistic back to the original shape because I can bookkeep where each of these features were coming from, right? And so that allows us now to think about what we're going to do later down the line, like a variable selection type method, okay? Now, let me just show you really quickly how this works in real data. You might be like, okay, these are cool features, but what can I actually use this for, right? Um, so let's take a really cool example in, in radiomics. So um, here we have MRI scans from 40 patients that have glioblastoma, a, a particular brain cancer. Um, we're going to take data MRIs that are, these have been archived, are publicly available in the uh, Cancer Imaging Archive. Um, and these also have matched genomic and clinical data collected from the TCGA, okay? So here's what the data looks like. What we do is we go in and we um, segment out the tumors. So on the right-hand side, you see the segmented, segmented version of, of, of these tumors for each. We do this for every slice, for every individual. And then we construct 
um, these topological summary statistics by doing these sweeps over these slices. Okay, so these are now our features. Now, my group thinks about nonlinear regression, and we'll get about into a little bit about like why we think about this. But here we have these curves, and so we can fit this via some like nonlinear method, right? Let's say we're going to do this via like a GP. So here we have a Gaussian process. Um, for those who are unaware, we're just putting like a prior over the function space these these Euler characteristics come from. I'm going to allow the mean function of the GP to be zero. The k here is obviously a covariance function. It's going to measure this. You can think about this as measure the similarity between this topological summary statistics from patient one and patient two, right? So k x one x two is saying how close in some nonlinear way are the topological summary statistics that I derive from the MRI scan of the first patient versus those I got for the second patient, right? So on and so forth. Now the, the outcome of this of this uh, study was to say, can is a topological summary stat more predictive of some kind of clinical outcome, like let's say disease-free survival or overall survival, than things that we collect from patients all the time. That's MRI or mRNA gene expression data. People a lot of times collect tumor morphometrics from these data sets. People also collect tumor volume and geometrics from these data sets. So, you know, uh, volume and other types of things. Um, and so what we're saying is, is the older characteristic a better uh, predictor than these, these phenotypes, than these other classically uh, collected features? Now, uh, it's important for me to talk about what these, each of uh, these diseases are, or these outcomes are. Disease-free survival is the time that a patient was diagnosed to the time that that patient uh, suffered relapse, meaning that cancer came back. Overall survival is the total time from that patient was diagnosed when that patient passed away, right? That's how we defined it, okay? Um, and then we, we did this based on like 20, 80, 20 splits, did this a hundred times, and then we tracked root mean squared error each time, okay? So here are the results, and let me kind of walk you through them. So, so here we have uh, root mean squared error, the lower term, uh, lower number means better. Um, the probability optimal thing is out of, out of each of those hundred splits, which time was this predictor the best, right? So out of that time, what percent of the time was that predictor the best one? And here's what I kind of get out of this. And so you see the SCCT at the bottom is bolded. Um, it did better in each of these scenarios. Um, I, I want to draw attention to that. The overall survival for me is effectively they're all the same. Like overall survival is a very murky uh, phenotype. It's you don't have to necessarily die, particularly from the, the actual disease itself. A lot of the complications can go wrong with cancer patients. So the overall survival one is a lot more noisy as a phenotype. And so for me, I kind of look at that as kind of all of them being exactly the same. The more interesting one to me is the, is the left-hand side, which is disease-free survival. And there is a prior big gap here. And so let me kind of walk you through where I've been thinking about um, since we did this paper. Um, and prediction is nice, but I kind of thought, well, would it be cool if there was actually like a variable selection method or interpretability method here that we could build where we connect shape to genotype, okay? So let me kind of walk people through what I mean by this. So um, therapeutic resistance, for those who don't necessarily know, you know, in our well old in our healthy bodies, our cells are kind of well-oiled machines, right? So, you know, in terms of growth for our cells, right, growth signals come in. You could think about uh, gene activation and pathways, that, uh, this nice little cartoon is like linear thing where growth signals come in, gene A talks to gene B, B talks to C, C talks to D, D downstream tells the cell it's okay to survive, proliferate and grow, and if things get out of hand, uh, apoptose, right, die. Um, in a cancerous setting, things are all out of whack. And so in this like molecular signaling pathway, a lot of times we have some mutation, right? And this pathway is now constitutively active, right? So B is always on, C is always talking to, uh, B is always talking to C, C is always talking to D, D is always telling the cell survive, proliferate and grow, even when you're not supposed to, you get irregular growth. And that's when you have some kind of uh, tumor setting happen, right? Now, for those who are not, maybe not the work in this space, you know, a lot of times that we have these agents, these drug agents that can come in and block the activation of signaling cascades, right? So we have some drug agent that comes in and targets gene B, B is always off, now C is always off, D is always off, um, the, the, the cell is now apoptosing and the person looks healed, right? Um, now, resistance happens when either, and even in the presence of drug, uh, this pathway is now reactivated somehow, right? And, or, or other pathways downstream or, or similar pathways with similar functions are now activated. In any case, survival and proliferation is always happening. And then you have uh, this person that then relapsed, right? And, this, and even in the presence of drug, drug no longer works and this idea of resistance occurs, okay? 
And what this paper with the glioblastoma kind of made me think about is, can you actually use shape variation to explain biological phenomena, right? Or in other words, is there something about shape where you can identify structural fingerprints that are signatures of what you see happening molecularly on the molecular level. This idea of mapping shape variation on the genotypic or phenotypic variation, right? So to do this, we don't wanna do prediction anymore. What we wanna actually do is variable selection, right? I wanna be able to identify structural fingerprints that I can say, okay, that's a signature of this signaling cascade, right? In, a, in an ideal world. And so that brings us to Sinatra. So Sinatra is, is the, the acronym stands for sub-image analysis using top line summary statistics. Sinatra has a double meaning for me in the sense that um, I, my lab does a lot of stuff. Um, we do a little statistical genetics, cancer genomics, interpretable machine learning, top line data analysis. Sinatra is the first project that kind of takes these disparate sounds and kind of combines them into one cohesive project, right? So it kind of has this cool double means in me of like, we now have a cohesive jazz sound between all the things that we do in the lab, which is actually pretty fun. So Sinatra is just a pipeline for doing this idea of variable selection with three-dimensional objects, okay? So let me kind of walk you how these steps go. We take some two-dimensional, we take some two, uh, 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 three-dimensional shapes from two different groups. So here we have teeth again from primates. We have a tooth from a carnivore and a herbivore. What we do is for each of these teeth, we have collections of them for like many different primates. For each tooth in the data set, we create some topological summary statistics for them. So we take each mesh, run these sweeps over them, collect these early characteristic curves. Now I have a collection of curves for every tooth in my data set for species A and species B. What I do then is we do variable selection on these curves. So we basically do a classification model. We identify the pieces of the curves that define or describe the variation between these two groups. So that's what you see in red here at the bottom in panel C. Because the older characteristic is invertible, what we do is we take those red regions of these curves and map them back onto the actual surface themselves and then highlight the enrichment between these two groups. Okay, so I'll walk you through each step of this pipeline. Remember, Sinatra is just a pipeline. So I like to say the data scientists, like everyone in this on this call now, and statisticians and computer scientists, is if you hate any step of the pipeline I'm going to show you, that's fine. Remove what I actually do and place it with your own pipe. Okay. Um, so Sinatra just has four general steps, right? One is you want to take shapes and represent them via summary statistics that are uh, that summarize their topology and geometry. Uh, the second thing is you wanna define some probability or statistical model to classify these shapes based on these summary stats. Then you wanna derive some association metric for each topological or geometric feature. Now I'm gonna show what we do in my group, but this could be anything. This could be a lasso. You could think about um, uh, saliency maps. You could think about posterior inclusion probabilities, p-values, whatever the case might be. I'll show you what we do in my group. Um, and then once you have the significant features, you want to be able to then project those back onto the actual original shape or original 3D surface, okay? So we already talked about what we're going to do for the first step. We're going to use all the characteristic to represent our shapes, okay? Let's stick within this GP space a little bit. I'm going to say that um, uh, we're going to use this Gaussian process type model, this nonlinear regression model to, to model our summary statistics. And now let's talk about how we're gonna derive an, an association uh, metric for using GPs, okay? So the reason why my group likes to use nonlinear methods is because nonlinear methods see the entire piece of the pie, right? So, you know, if I go back to my variation uh, statement, you know, nonlinear models see both the linear and nonlinear component, which could be quite important for different phenotypes and traits of interest, right? Linear models only see a partial point of the part of that pie. But the, the key thing about linear models is you have interpretability hypothesis testing rules here that you don't necessarily get on the right hand side, right? So what my group thinks about is like, how do we build methods on the right hand side that still give us some kind of interpretability that you naturally get for free when you use linear models on the left hand side, okay? And so this, this comes back to this idea of like the kernel trick issue, okay? Um, I have some high dimensional P space with like a lot of features and I can use a linear model, but I know if I use a nonlinear model, I can define some covariance function, project my data into some RKHS space. I can do nice predictions with my nonlinear regression model. 
Now, the issue though is once I do these nice predictions, if I wanna know how these nice predictions are summarized in terms of like how my kernel machine or how my Gaussian process was upweighting or downweighting features to get this really nice prediction, there's no way to really project this back onto my original covariate space, right? So the idea of like, once you use Gaussian processes, the typical downside of them is that the classic idea of variable selection is lost, right? So I spent a lot of time in my PhD and also the earlier stages of my um, uh, faculty position at Brown really thinking about these kind of questions. And I still am really interested in these kind of questions. Um, so let's go back to like stat 101, since I, I teach linear models at, at Brown. <laughs> Uh, you know, in a regression model, what makes things interpretable is this idea of an effect size estimate, right? So we have some regression model here, um, an effect size, these beta hats are literally just like this idea of projecting your data onto the column space of like your design, page, right? Like project Y onto the column space of X. And we can use any kind of projection we want, but let's stick in regular least square space. And we're just gonna take the generalized inverse and project Y onto the column space of my data. So these beta hats then are what we then use to derive things like p-values and so on and so forth, right? Now, the effect size analog for GPs and, and kernel models kind of works very similarly, except instead of projecting y onto the column space of x, I'm gonna project my smooth nonlinear learned function onto my column space of x, okay? And we're gonna call this beta tilde an effect size analog, like an analog to what beta hats are. Again, you could think about any kind of projection that you want. In fact, there are a lot of people thinking about this in places like Chicago, UT Austin now, thinking about how to derive like really interesting projections that you can start to tease apart certain features that you learn in your nonlinear space. Let's keep it very easy here. Let's have it be very mirrored to what we do in linear regression. And let's just have this also be a standard general projection onto um, so we'll just use again the generalized inverse. Okay. Now I went to Duke. I'm a uh, Bayesian by uh, training, <laughs> um, and so let's say that we're going to set up like a Gibbs sampler here for our our weight space view on a GP. Um, what's really nice about these these projections is once I define them, I can you know I can now sample in an algorithm, get some uncertainty estimates for both my function f. The rest of the hyperparameters in my model, but also I can then use these. Uh, every time I see a new f, I can deterministically just figure out what a new beta tilde draw might be, right? And so I can derive things like posterior predictive distributions and, and things like that. Okay. Now the, the downside of these beta tildes is that they're just weights, right? That you can't really just take them and say I'm going to now do hypothesis testing with them. They don't really give you some kind of idea of significance. Okay. So let me try to tell you what my group does and, and stick with me a little bit. Um, my group thinks about some of these, uh, one way to do variable selection is to think about relative importance. So, so how relatively important is one variable relative to the information I gain from the other variables, right? And so you can think about this almost like a network, right? Let's look at a, an example here and let's go to sports to do this. So let's, let's say I have a sports team, um, any sports team, and let's say collectively that sports team has some information collectively together, right? Now, one way I can figure out how important each player is in this, in this team is I can say, let's just go in and put everyone uh, iteratively on an injury reserve, okay? So let's put number 30 there in the corner on injury reserve, number 30 is not playing. Without number 30 on the team, my, the, the, the collection, the network as a whole of my team might've shifted a little bit without his presence, but, but maybe not as much, right? I, I might be able to still have the full like identity in terms of information built in about this network, right? Now let's say I take another player, anyone, and let's say that he goes and plays Space Jam or goes, uh, or goes to Space Jam or goes to decides to play baseball, right? Without this guy on the court, I might lose a lot more information, right? Um, I don't know who this, anyone, right? I might just lose more information, right? So one way to kind of measure the relative importance is the, the amount of information I might have lost with that person not being there, right? So we can quantify this via KL divergences. Right? So one way to think about this is I can measure the influence of every variant in my data set onto the rest of the variants in my data by taking the KL divergence between the conditional distribution with the effect of that variable being set to zero and the marginal distribution with that variable's effect having been marginalized out, okay? And now the KL divergence being zero, I mean the difference between those distributions being zero can be interpreted as that variable is not a key explanatory variable relative to the others. Right? Or in other words, the KL divergence is zero if and only if those two distributions are exactly the same. Right? 
So what we do in my group is we look at this from like the rate measure, right? So rate is just taking these KL divergences and scaling them so that they all sum to one, right? Um, this gives us a really nice null, right? So rates null is that everyone in the data set is equal to each other. Like I have a bunch of bench players. And the alternative is that some data is more important than others, right? So that you, so the null is like we have equal contribution. The alternative is that we don't, right? Um, so let me kind of show you how this works in data really quickly. Um, I'll, I'm going to simulate data with 2,000 samples, 25 genetic markers. I'm going to let only three of these genetic markers be causal. So those are going to be my Jordan, Pippin, and Rodman. Okay. And then I'm going to perform GP regression and then identify these causal variables using the rate. Okay. Um, so as you can see with one run, I have uh, Jordan, Pippin, and Rodman have been identified. Now what we can do is I can say, um, really interestingly, let's say I take Jordan. Um, oh, so let me just orient everyone really quickly. So my features are on the bottom there. The rate measures on the on the y-axis. That red line is that one over p line. That's why that's the idea of me not having any important variables. Now let's say I take Jordan, take him out of the game, and I iteratively take every other player out of the game with him. Okay. Now what happens is the model. Uh, the, what rate says is that okay, based on Jordan being out and then everyone else iteratively being out. The two best players on the team are still Pippen and Rodman, but the rest of the importance from my other players has gone up, right? And you can see it's gone up almost like uniformly. It's almost to say like I lost 40 points a game. So those 40 points have to be come from somewhere. So everyone else has to step up without our star, right? But everyone's going to step up uniformly because they're all basically random noise, right? Like they have no association with the outcome, right? We do this again, I do the same thing with, with Pippin um, and Jordan being out. I still identify Rodman. You can see everyone else is still kind of uniformly uh, distributed. I could then remove uh, Rodman as well. I just have basically a simple uniform distribution, right? Um, I said the sanity tech, I said, what if I took out number 30? So you can see nothing really happens. Um, and then you can see, what if I just generate data, which is only simply uh, stochastic noise? And you can see everyone kind of hovers around this line. So that's what we're going to use. We're going to use the rate measure to form our GP regression to identify which topological summary statistics are more are, are should be uh, prioritized higher than other ones, right? In our very poor prioritization method. Now, the key thing about the Sinatra idea is that we, once we identify these uh, important features, we want to be able to map those back onto the actual sheet themselves, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, we're going to I, we're going to leverage this idea that directions in our filtration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a shape, I filter across in that direction, I rotate the shape, filter again. Directions that are close to each other are probably going to hold similar information in terms of which topological features are most important. So we're going to leverage that correlation across, across directions in order to improve our ability to be most sure that the features that we're identifying are important, right? So what we do in our reconstruction is I pick a set of cone of directions. I, for each direction, identify the Topological features that were selected by the GP and rate. Um, I repeat this process for another cone, and I do this for all cones, and then I take the union of these mapped vertices, right, to then highlight in my final uh, heat map type uh, summary. Okay, so let me show you how this works. We take a cone, that cone has some features in this direction um, that we then map. We save those features. I take another one. I have another set of features that I identify, I save those, and then we reconstruct our object, okay? Now for the last like 20 minutes or so, or 15 minutes or so, what I really wanna do is like talk about like the really cool parts of like how Sinatra works in like simulations. And this is something I actually took really for granted. Simulations for shapes are hard. Um, it's something that I take for granted that we do in genetics all the time where I have a genotype matrix and I can create synthetic phenotypes with real genotypes of different structures and, and we can think about different types of effects and everything's very well controlled and, and that framework is really widely used and it's easy to kind of calibrate how well methods are doing. In this space, not so much. And so what we did is we actually created a really nice framework for people who maybe want to think about how to benchmark their methods in this space um, via simulations. And so we're gonna start with a proof of concept simulation here. Um, one is I have, so we're gonna take very simple, I'm gonna have spheres. These spheres are going to be split into two groups. Um, to create shared regions, 
I'm gonna take uh, all hundred spheres and I'm gonna basically give them these cusps. So you see these blue regions at the bottom. Basically I'm gonna take these like elongated features out, right? Then I'm gonna create causal regions um, by basically taking these indentations only in uh, um, class specific regions. So for class one, I'll do these indentations like in this region, for class two, I'll do those indentations in some other region, right? Then the idea is like, can Sinatra identify the vertices in these regions um, more so than it could do anywhere else, right? So basically trying to identify false positives versus true positives, right? Um, so we want to find vertices in those red regions. And so here's some results from a sensitivity analysis. So at the top here, you're seeing this kind of like cusp and indentation kind of framework, but I'm making it a little harder as I go across scenarios. Um, and on the bottom, you see rock curves, so true positive versus false positive rate, and how well Sinatra can identify the vertices in those red regions. Um, what you can see is uh, something that's really intuitive. As I increase the heterogeneity or I increase the number of indentations in the shapes, Sinatra's power decreases. And that's something that's very actually easy to understand why that happens. Think about it like we do in gen, like if you're a geneticist, we do this, we think about this a lot. You can think about this as a sparse architecture versus something that's polygenic, okay? Or if I go back to my sphere example, on the left-hand side of scenario one, I only have one causal feature, right? So that's like saying I take my pie and I break it up into say like only five slices. The effect sizes for every single vertex is quite large, right? I took that thing up and only broke it up into five slices. Now, as I increase the number of causal regions, I'm increasing the number of causal vertices. And so I'm taking that pie now and breaking it up into many little slices. So every vertex now has a tiny slice and it gets harder and harder for Sinatra to identify those, those many effects with small, those many uh, causal vertices with small, tiny effects, right? There's a, there's a nice analogy there that we think about in genetics quite a bit. Um, what we did here is we compared this against different methods. So what's really uh, cool here is that none of these are apples to apples. We kind of had to make this like uh, 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 do this ourselves uh, at the, the because the reviewer really wanted us to. Um, what you see is uh, you can think about a really easy example where I take like an elastic, I take the vertices of every single shape. I, I basically have them as the XYZ coordinates as three different features. I can run a lasso on those or an elastic net. That could be an easy kind of um, a benchmark. You could do this in a group lasso kind of way. Um, the limit shapes algorithm and something comes from a group at Harvard, but we kind of worked with the authors to figure out a way to kind of make their algorithm and uh, useful for ours. And you can see how well each method kind of does um, in this very easy um, baseline sphere uh, example. Um, we have a really cool null hypothesis check here, which is remember I said is Sinatra, uh, what rate does is say that every variable is contributing equally to the output, right? So what that does is that creates two scenarios um, for a null case where where Sinatra is like not that useful. The first case is where I have um, two shapes that look exactly the same. So I have two classes of shapes that look almost exactly the same, except like maybe some like tiny Gaussian ones, right? Um, what you can see here is what Sinatra's, what rate is gonna say and what Sinatra is gonna say is, well, every vertex is the same. So every vertex is contributing equally to the output. And so I'm just going to say that everything should be reconstructed similarly. And I'm gonna say everything is important here because everything is equally important. The second case is the alternative. So that's one in the spectrum. We have the other in the spectrum, which is like, I have two shapes that are completely different from each other, right? Same thing, Sinatra is gonna say, well, everything's important. Everything explains variation here. Everything is equally important. So I'm, I can't really see the difference here. And so what this does is it creates a really nice use case for Sinatra. Sinatra is not useful for things that you can do by eye, right? If you can look at two shapes and say, these things are exactly the same, or you can look at two shapes and say like, these tapes are exactly, are totally different. There's no reason to run Sinatra on them. Sinatra's biggest use case is where you have some kind of intermediate thing at play, right? You know, there's some things that are similar. You have a hunch or a hypothesis that some things are different and then you're able to use Sinatra there, right? Um, and so that's the that's the kind of use case scenario from that point. Now we did one more simulation scenario. Where we did a characterization to make things a little bit more realistic and not so easy, like these basic spheres. Um, so what we did here is I took we took real teeth from primates. So I have a real tooth, and I'm going to create my two different classes of shapes. 
by basically placing landmarks on each two in different spots and then making caricatures of them. So for class one, I pick three different regions, what you're seeing in that red there. And then I blow them up based on um, some algorithm, right? To make these things caricatures of what they used to look like. I'll do this according to some random noise. That'll be my shape class one. I'll do the same thing for shape class two. And then in the third panel, what you're seeing is well, Sinatra, okay, do your, uh, run the algorithm or the pipeline, reconstruct these shapes and identify these caricature landmarks. And what you're seeing is how well Sinatra can do here. Now there's more realistic example of shapes with more curvature and things like that. Um, you, same kind of idea holds. Sinatra does better for, for lower number of landmarks and high number of landmarks, right? The same thing we saw in the spheres. The interesting thing is this actually really confuses most of the other baselines that we had. So things doing something simple like the elastic net or some root lasso on the vertices no longer works. They're actually just like completely random. So they fall directly on diagonal. Um, and the limit shapes algorithm also has a hard time. Um, what's really interesting about the limit shapes algorithm though is it works well when you know correspondences between the two shapes. So if I give the limit shapes algorithm a, like a map that says that these points correspond to each other on each shape. So I give it like this huge matrix that said, these are how each these, these uh, shapes in this data set are related, um, which is really hard to curate sometimes. It does really well. The minute that you get that, um, that uh, contact map like a little bit off, it starts to greatly lose power. And so that's kind of what you see in the, in the blue line versus that pink line. Um, as our very last examples, we ran this on real data. I stuck in these cases where we had like pseudo ground truth because it was hard to kind of run this in like a discovery type of way since this is such a new uh, uh, space. Um, so here we take real data from, from uh, four different groups of primates. What we treat as our ground truth is that the tarsius monkeys have a uh, cusp in their primitive lower molar that they need to eat, be, be able to digest foods that the other monkeys don't have. And so we use that as our ground truth feature. And so phylogenetically, um, all the monkeys look like this in terms of relatedness. That red cusp is the thing that the tarsius have that the others don't. Um, and so what we do is we compare the tarsius to each group of other primates and say, how well can Sinatra identify that red cusp uh, uh, more than just by doing it randomly by chance, right? Um, and so here are some results. You can see uh, uh, as you move further up in the phylogenetic scale, as things become a little bit more distant genetically, you can see how more prominent that red region gets. But this is how well Sinatra identifies things. And in the paper, we go into many more different analyses. Um, one thing I did want to show here that I'm like, kind of really excited about that I think is kind of the, goal, uh, the hidden gem in this paper is that you can actually um, align shapes using their topological summary statistics. So I got a lot of pushback from a reviewer, rightfully so, who kept complaining that we were making these uh, claims that Sinatra can be ran on uh, shapes that you don't have one-to-one uh, -one correspondence. So you can run in things where you don't have diffeomorphisms, right? But, he's, but the reviewer said that I, while making this claim, what we were doing is pre-aligning shapes which automatically gave them these different, like these nice one-to-one -one correspondences after we did this pre-alignment. So they challenge us to say, can you run this without doing any pre-alignment? And it's a really cool fact that you can actually run Sinatra on non-aligned shapes. So here at the top, we have unaligned shapes. We run our all the characteristics on each of these unaligned shapes. We get summary statistics for each of them, these curves. If you normalize or minimize the distance between these curves, you actually can implicitly align the shapes. And so what you're seeing in panel B here is this alignment that was done by minimizing or basically normalizing all the characteristics first and then reconstructing shapes. And this is what you see as terms of their alignment. Uh, as a whole, it's not perfect, but it is a really interesting thing that you can do this. Here's something that you can do with like something like Auto3, uh, Auto3DGM, which is like an alignment software see how nicely aligned the shapes are. Here's the same kind of thing where we align the shapes based on their topological summary statistics. It's not perfect, but it's actually quite interesting that if we were to think about how to perfect the algorithm, which we're doing now, you might be able to think about really cool grand scale things that you can do with uh, TDA in, in alignment-based um, uh, data science type domains. Um, and then here's kind of a result that you can do um, on the uh, aligned shapes that were done using all the characteristics only.
Um, and so uh, future ongoing work for us is, is quite interesting. So um, at some point, I do want to move back to thinking about uh, working on shapes, some resistances that derive from using MRIs and, and get back to radiomics and, and oncology. Um, this is quite challenging, though. And I, I, I like to tell people that the things I showed you today are actually relatively easy. And the, and the, and the reason I say that is because um, for Sinatra, um, intraclass heterogeneity is low in, in, in teeth space, right? Phylogenetics and selection has defined that if a tooth is not shaped a certain way, I have a certain morphology, that monkey cannot digest certain food, so it's going to die. So you have these nice um, global type changes that are different in these different structures. That's easier for Sinatra to pick up than something like a tumor, which has no kind of laws of growth that we necessarily know in terms of short term. And, and uh, interclass heterogeneity, so if I think about mutation classes, between mutation classes or even within mutation classes can be quite high, right? Tumor can grow, however, and it's not quite sure how you think about um, minimizing that heterogeneity within a, within a given group. Um, but that is, a, that is an ongoing question and something that we've been thinking quite a bit about. Um, and so the, and the other thing that we've been thinking about is how to extend TDA to imaging. So not just like meshes and shapes, but also like uh, things like 3D microscopy or things like PET scans, right? Things where maybe you have texture or you have, those, like how do we think about uh, incorporating top line data analysis and something like Sinatra into these kind of domains. Um, and so we've been developing continuous invariance for which you can do both simultaneous inference on topology and geometry. And so we've been thinking about that um, uh, as well. Um, lastly, I kind of want to point everyone to this last thing of, of Sinatra Pro, which is like a protein uh, extension of this. Proteins are cool because you go, because they can be highly flexible or highly rigid. So they kind of sit in between the teeth and the tumors to me. Um, and so, so Sinatra Pro is a paper that should be on by archive relatively soon of us doing the same kind of idea, but basically identifying um, biophysical structures and protein dynamics. And so that's actually been super fun. Um, I've been lucky to work with people who have been teaching me a lot about structural biology. So like, why not just add one more thing that the group can think about and see, right? Um, so with that, I really wanna thank everyone for hanging out for the last hour. Um, uh, this is a huge group effort from many different people in many different places. Um, and people have been really nice enough to give us money. Uh, so uh, with that, here's some relative references and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, it was a really, really fantastic and interesting talk. Um, feel free if anybody has any questions to put them in the Q&A. There was one question in the chat in the middle of the talk that I think was ended up mostly being the subject of the rest of the talk. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna skip this, but for the person that asked that, if you felt like your question was not answered, feel free to, um, to send it in again. Um, I will take uh, uh, the host's privilege while we're waiting for okay. questions to come in. Actually, my first question was going to be about the alignment of these shapes. So you, mm -hmm. um, you, you got to mine as well. Um, but I guess to, to, to follow up on that, I mean, do you think that, like if you have shapes that are very, very different from each other that maybe you shouldn't even be comparing, mm -hmm. um, presumably they will be very difficult to align. It might produce some kind of noise. Could you like have, would there be like an adversarial possibility? Like you could make a, a shape that sort of causes you to flip around your alignment or something weird? That's like a good that. question. We've been thinking about, so we've been thinking about this in protein alignment space. So I have a, I have a student who's, who's, who uh, led the, the Sinatra Pro extension. And we've been thinking about this as a protein alignment question, which is like a, I guess a hugely um, uh, explored uh, space, but thinking about how to maybe incorporate something like a GAN or something in, involved. I don't necessarily know if there's a immediately nice way to do it. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a really good example though. That's a really good, that's a really good thought. We should talk about this offline. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great thought. We, so we haven't done this for tumors. We've been doing this for like things like proteins yeah. um, and teeth, things where, where we kind of know you might have that. I, in the radiomic space, this might be like a wild, wild west type of thing. And we might be um, a little bit dependent on things like registration. So what, uh, what angles these MRIs were even taken from in the first place, like trying to use as much background information as possible to try to figure some of this stuff out. Um, if you do the alignment in TDA space, 
and so we do go to the tumors. Um, you would be working in a space that's like agnostic to like some of these other things that maybe you you don't want to be tripped up on. So you're really just thinking about doing things based on like holes and vertices and stuff. But I don't know if that's a smart thing to do in radiomics. And that's like a really good question. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, we have another question in the chat here. Uh, are there plans to include a time domain? It seems like yes. uh, it would be low resolution, but um, it could be interesting. Yeah, we thought about this a lot. So Brown actually has a um, uh, like a skeletal type lab where, where people have thought about, uh, they have they take videos of like how fish eat certain foods and things like that. We've been thinking about how to take this to like a, a, a four dimensional type of thing. Um, yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting thing. I, I don't know how well things will transfer over in that, in that, that um, when you start adding time, um, but it's a super interesting thing where you can, um, especially when you think about if I have different species of fish, right? Like how do certain fish dislocate their jaws to eat certain foods in certain ways? And, and that's something that people highly study. And it'd be cool to think about if, if TDA could be something that you could use even there. Yeah. You know, also, I think if you had tumor scans over time or something, mm. you could think about tumor evolution in 3D space as well yeah. as like genetic evolution at the same one, time. One thing we've also thought about is why not, which is a fair question that we got in the, in the SCT paper at JASA was, um, why not combine them? Why, why treat these features as independent and not treat it as like a multifaceted uh, problem, which it is. Um, and I think it's like also a fair question. So one other thing is that we've been thinking about too is like how to take a multi-omics point of view where maybe TDA is another omic that you also want to incorporate in your models um, or control for. And that could be something that could also be pretty cool uh, to think about as well. So yeah, getting back to this, this getting at the sort of multi-omic question and you're thinking about like, um, 2D uh, sort of geometric. Have you thought about um, the data sets where you you sort of have um, positional RNA seq combined with uh, uh, like geometric shape? Like I forget the word, which acronym it is, but I yeah, don't yeah. Know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we have we have so uh, right the spatial transcriptomics type spatial stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We I I just started like playing around with that. We started sending papers around my group like maybe last month on like, hey, we should maybe think about how to combine some of these things. Um, I think what's I think what we have to do first is try to figure out how to understand the manifold. If we go back to the oncology example, understand the manifold for which these tumor shapes lie on and really get a sense for what is similar and what is different. And I think once you understand that um, within a group, then once you understand that, you can start to understand how to define, how to do comparisons across groups. The other thing I really thought about here too is our definition of phenotypes might be too simplistic in oncology. So it might not be good enough just to say that you have a KRAS mutation and you have like an IDH1 or you have a, you have mutation A, you have mutation B. It might be much more multifaceted than that in the sense that you may want to define classes based on mutational profiles or something else that's not just um, binary indicators. And so that's something else we've been really thinking about is how do you, it's easy to think about herbivore and a carnivore or something, but when you move, or even in proteins, like one mutation changes how, some, changes how something folds completely. And it's easy to think about that, but in tumors, maybe not so much. And so we need to think about that as well. And the last thing that we really need to do that I would love to talk to people about they're really interested in is how to extend Sinatra to continuous phenotypes. So one thing that we've done here is we stuck to classification metrics. We have class A versus class B. Um, and we do that because we can uh, assess them. I, can, I figured out how to do simulations where I can assess how uh, much power we might have in one case versus another. But when you move to oncology, a lot of times you have a continuous output, right? I have survival, I have treatment efficacy, I have something, some continuous number. And we don't have theory right now in shape statistics, I don't think of like, how can you simulate a data, a shape with where you have an ob, we have some kind of feature of that shape that is connected to the variation of some output. And you can control that variation. It's almost like a likelihood, a hierarchical likelihood based model for generating shapes and continuous outputs in a way that might be relevant when we think about oncology, right? And so GANs aren't necessarily super pro, like, uh, great for that because I wanna be able to control causal features, right? And so like, how do we think about um, getting into a more principled way where we can actually assess our models 
um, in that space. So I think there are like a lot of intermediate steps we need to take in order to get there, but I still think it's uh, quite promising as, as a future direction. So I have, I have one more question in the chat here. We're, a bit, we're running out of time, but I wanted <laughs> to get to this one. But um, there's a person is asking, uh, it's a, I'm still not quite understanding what a filter sweep looks like visually. Um, mm -hmm. They're imagining a contour map per sweep and then a Euclidean distance between sweeps. Uh, is this accurate? Right, so the sweeps in practice are actually a little bit more simple than that. So what we do is we, so in all the characteristic terms, we take a, uh -oh. you start from one angle of the shape and you basically filter across. What you do is you filter over this filtration and you count vertices, edges, and faces at each step. So you basically count you just do the order characteristic computation at every at every step, and you the filtration are discretized, right? It's not continuous in practice; it's discretized. So you're basically counting across, and at each step you're counting up to that point, and you're counting the vertices of the faces up to that step, and you continue all the way through, right? And that gives you this nice curve. Um, there are many things to think about in that filtration. One is um, the discretization. Uh, in terms of the filtration is a hyperparameter. So you could think where many fine steps might be more suitable for one application, larger steps may be suitable for, for another. So that is something that we talk quite a bit about in each of these papers is um, the way that you define the number of filtrations that you're taking per object could depend on the, uh, or should depend on the application of interest. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we, we have one more comment. Uh, oh, yes, good. Uh, it was very helpful. The cool. course and, uh, the clarification. So thank you so much. Um, really, really cool, creative um, work, the, very different from what you normally see in cool. computational biology and genomics. And thank you um, so much for, uh, for giving this talk. And thank you to everybody for attending. All right. I will, um, I will end the recording there. Thank you so